Welcome back everyone. Over the next series of lectures, we're going to be coding along with a regression-based project, where based off the data set for different housing features, we're going to try to predict the price that a house should sell at. So based off things like the number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, square footage, etc., we'll try to build a deep learning model that can actually predict the price of a house. So a big part of this is exploratory data analysis as well as feature engineering, which is what we're going to focus on in part one. Let's head over to a notebook and get started. I am here at a notebook and I've already imported pandas, numpy, matplotlib, and seaborn. As a quick note, if you go to our ANNs folder, the notebook that corresponds to this lecture or series of lectures is called Keras Regression. It's right after the syntax basics. And if you open it up, you should be able to scroll down and then see a full description of all the feature columns. So some of these feature columns, it may not be uh, quite obvious what the actual feature column stands for. So here we have the actual definitions in case you're interested in it. So we're gonna come back here and let's load up our data. We'll say df is equal to pd.readcsv and our data is located underneath our data folder. So if you go back up a directory and this is called kc underscore house underscore data dot csv. Go ahead and read it in. And again, if you check out our regression notebook, we're actually using this data. So it's a real world data set from a Kaggle link. So you can check out the actual link right here. But basically what this is, it's historical pricing data for house sales in King County, USA. And King County is essentially where Seattle is. So we're gonna come back here to our notebook and we're gonna explore this data a little bit using some visualization techniques. So first, let's see if we have any missing data. We'll say df is null dot sum. And so what this does is first off, df is null. That just returns back true or false if something is null. So if something is missing, it will return back true. And I can actually then sum these up per column and it will treat falses as zeros and trues as ones. And that way we can actually get a count of how many missing data points we have. And for this particular data set, we actually have no missing data, which kind of makes sense. If a house was historically sold, it's not like you wouldn't know the number of bedrooms the house had before you sold it. So for this particular data set, it makes sense that there is no missing data. Later on in this section of the course, we'll show you how to deal with a data set that does have missing data. And another thing I like to do after you check out how much data is missing is just do a quick describe call, which will give you the statistical analysis on your data set. And I personally like to transpose this so that I get to see the statistical means, standard deviation, min, percentile values, etc., for all the columns. Now, some of these doesn't really mean anything. So later on, if you actually see the head of the data frame, you'll notice that one of them is just a unique ID. So this is some sort of unique ID for the sale. So it doesn't really make sense to look into any meaning for the mean of the IDs. However, other things like the mean price could be really important. So we can see here that we have this scientific notation, which basically means 5.4 times 10 to the power of five. So essentially add in five zeros. Okay, so we have all that information. It's a little hard to just read this table and thoroughly understand it. Let's start actually describing it through visualization using Seaborn and Matplotlib and all those skills we learned in the data visualization crash course section. So something I could do especially for continuous labels, is just do a distribution of the actual label. So do a distribution plot, essentially a histogram. And something else I can do is just make this a little larger by calling plt.figure and setting fig size to, let's say, 10 by six. So I'll go ahead and run that and I get to see this distribution so notice here, it looks like most of our houses are falling somewhere between zero and maybe around $1.5 million. And we could have these extreme outliers here for the really expensive houses. And it may actually make sense to drop those outliers in our analysis if they are just a few points that are very extreme. And so we can essentially build a model that realistically predicts the price of a house if its intended value is somewhere between, let's say zero and $2 million. And there's not gonna be that many houses apparently on the market that are worth more than let's say 3 million. So that's something to keep in mind here, especially if we're applying this to a realistic situation. Maybe we're trying to build a model for a real estate agency. 
since there's really not that many houses on the market that are that expensive, it may not be really useful to actually have our model train on these uh, extreme outliers. Now we can go ahead and do similar analysis of different features. So for example, for categorical ones, such as number of bedrooms, which is kind of continuous, but you can't have really 1.5 bedrooms. You can actually have that for bathrooms, but for the case of bedrooms, we are in our data set, we don't really have actually 1.5 or 2.5. So we can treat this as a count plot. So I could say something like, go ahead and count bedrooms and then plot them out. And so here, I can see what actually looks like almost like a similar distribution where the vast majority of all these houses have somewhere between two to five bedrooms. And it looks like there's a huge mansion somewhere in this that has 33 bedrooms. So it looks like eight through 33 probably just have like one instance themselves, which is why they're showing up here, but we can't actually see that bar because no, the actual rest of the bedrooms are in the thousands. So it makes sense that you wouldn't really see a color for something as small as one. Now what's also nice is just comparing your label to some sort of feature that you think has a high correlation. And what you can do is you can say data frame correlation, run that, and then you can begin to see what actually correlates with your label. And off of this, I'm going to go ahead and grab my label. Let's just say price, run that, and let's go ahead and sort these values. We'll say sort underscore values. And here I can see things that are either um, highly positively correlated or highly negatively correlated. Obviously price is gonna be perfectly correlated with price, but it looks like the square feet of living space has a very high correlation with the actual price of the house. And what I would recommend doing is exploring highly correlated features with your label through a scatter plot. So for example, I could say SNS scatter plot and compare price to my square feet living space and say data is equal to DF. I'll go ahead and run that and I can see here a very strong linear relationship. And if I need to expand this out, notice that it looks like the price is overlapping. I could say PLT figure and just give it a little more space by saying fig size is equal to something like 10 by five. And that gives us an, a nice little space here. Okay, so again, I always recommend checking out the correlations between your different features and your actual label, and then exploring those correlations through, or exploring those features through some sort of data visualization. So for example, if we take a look here, it looks like bedrooms also has some positive correlation as well as bathrooms, and you can do count plots of those against the price as well, or even box plots to see the distributions. For example, I could say, box plot where X is the number of bedrooms, Y is the price, and then my data is DF. I'll go ahead and make this a little larger as well by doing a figure call here. Go ahead and make this 10 by six or something similar. And what this is showing me is the distribution of prices per bedrooms. So for example, I can see that there's quite a bit of variation in bedrooms ranging between three and seven. And that also makes sense because if we took a look at our count plot from before, uh, it looks like the majority of the houses have bedrooms between maybe three and seven. So it also makes sense that there's quite a large variety in prices there. So there is no right or wrong way to perform exploratory data analysis. So feel free to continue exploring this data set through any other features that you're interested in, either doing box plots or count plots. We should notice, however, that in our data set, if we take a look at the columns, we have this lat and long features. And if we take a look back at our actual feature columns, those actually stand for the latitude and longitude. So it may be interesting to actually explore this by plotting it out. And we can actually do a pretty good job of this just with a simple scatter plot. Now keep in mind, Seaborn doesn't actually have built-in geographical plotting capabilities. There's a little bit of that with matplotlib with some extension plugin libraries, but we're actually not gonna focus on trying to plot these points on top of a real world map. Instead, we can actually gain a lot of information with a little bit of cursory knowledge of what King County actually looks like, 
combined with a simple scatter plot call. So let's first see the distribution of prices per latitude versus longitude. So I'm going to come back to my notebook here. And all I'm going to do is see what do my prices look like. So we'll have price on the x-axis. And then is there some sort of differentiating factor just based off longitude? So then we'll say data is df. And since I have so many points in my data set, I'm going to make this figure quite a bit larger. We'll say plt figure and set fig size equal to, let's make it 12 by 8. So I can go ahead and run this. And I would expect to see just essentially kind of a flat blob here if there was no price differentiation based off longitude. But it looks like there tends to be some sort of price distribution at a certain longitude. So it looks like at longitude negative 122.2, that looks like an expensive housing area. You can see the distribution quite clearly here. And we can repeat this per latitude. So we can go ahead and change this from long to lat. And we can explore this as well. And the same behavior seems to pop up. It also seems that at particular latitude, there's some sort of expensive housing area. And basically what this is telling us is that it looks like at a certain combination of latitude and longitude, that tends to be an expensive area. So if we just look at a King County map, we can begin to discern this. And what we're going to do is we can see here essentially the city of Seattle and King County itself. Let's just plot out latitude versus longitude and plot out all these points. And then later we can affect their hue. So we're going to come back to our notebook. And we can already tell just from this evidence that there should be some hotspot on a map that has expensive houses. So we'll come back here and we'll do the following. I will scatter plot with x as my longitude and y as my latitude. And it should be in this order in order for the map to make sense. Otherwise, you'll end up flipping the coordinates of the map. And then we'll say, let's also make this larger, plt figure fig size is equal to 12 by 8. So this is just a simple scatter plot, and we get something that looks like this. And if we compare this to our actual map of King County, we can see that more or less they tend to match up. We can see here kind of the shapes of Seattle, and we can see here the real map of King County. So keep that in mind. And what we're going to do now is I'm going to start editing this to see if we can actually hone in on this expensive housing area. And one way we can do this is by attempting to say hue is equal to price. And what that is going to do is it's actually going to color these points darker or lighter based off their price. And I can begin to see a little bit here of a darker area. And it looks like it's actually matching up with our original estimates of the expensive longitude. So notice at negative 122.2, if I keep going up, I eventually hit these darker points. Same at around 47.6, which is kind of what we expected based off this latitude mapping. However, it looks like I'm not getting quite a color gradient as I would like. And that's because of those really expensive outlier housing, as well as the fact that we still have a marker edge here. So let's see if we can actually clean up this map a little bit by maybe dropping some of these outliers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at my data frame, and I'm going to sort the values based off price. And I will say ascending is equal to false. And let me just check out the top 20 most expensive houses. And whoops, this should be sort values. There we go. So note that in my top 20 houses, my most expensive house in this data set is $7.7 .7 million. And as I keep going down, you'll notice that it eventually kind of quickly drops off to something more reasonable, like 3.6. And if we take a look at our distribution of the prices of these houses, it looks like I should probably have some reasonable cutoff at $3 million because it looks like almost just that there's only 20 houses here that are above 3 million, or maybe a little bit more than that. So something I can do is I can just sample out the maybe top 1% of all houses. So if I take a look at the length of my data frame, I right now have around 21,000 houses in my data frame, which means 1% of this 
is 215 houses, which is actually quite a lot of houses. So let's go ahead and create another data frame, and we will call this non-top 1%, or you could relabel this as bottom 99%. And what we're going to do here is we'll take this same data frame that we created, DF sort values price ascending, and what I will do is I will grab everything after the top 1% of houses, which essentially means starting at index uh, integer location 216, go ahead and grab everything beyond that. So all I'm doing here is I'm grabbing the 99% bottom of houses. So I'm not dropping that much information, I'm only dropping 1% of information, but hopefully that drops all those really expensive outlier houses. And the reason for that is so I can get a more clear color distribution on this actual scatter plot. So we'll come back here. I have now my bottom 99% or non-top 1%. And let's go ahead and try this out again. I'm going to copy and paste this code here, except now my data is going to be equal to, instead of DF, that non-top 1% data frame. So I can run this. And now I can definitely see a lot clearer color distribution. And I can actually begin to play around with this. So for example, maybe I don't want an edge color. I don't want that white edge color. I begin to say edge color is equal to none. And since I have so many points stacked on top of each other, I'll also say alpha is equal to 0.2. And finally, I'll go ahead and choose a different color gradient. So this is something that's kind of totally optional for you, but I'll choose a red, yellow, green color gradient. So this is RDYLGN, and it's going to go from red to yellow to green. And that's going to make it a little clearer where the expensive housing is. So I run this again. Make sure to check your commas. You can always copy and paste these lines of code from the notebook. But now, this is a much better plot at showing me where the expensive parts of King County is. And I can see the distribution really clearly here. And you'll also notice that it almost looks like on the edge of the water, there tends to be some lighter points, which makes sense because usually a waterfront property is going to be more expensive than inland property. So this is a much better distribution and scatter plot map than our original mapping right here. While this does tell us a little bit of that information, we can start playing around with the actual data frame that we're plotting out. And we're still showing here 99% of all houses. And those outliers, we can kind of assume, are going to be somewhere either on the waterfront, on this top northern edge, or in this expensive area of King County. So lots of different things we can play around here to actually get better looking plots that are more informative to the user. And the other things we can show you here are things like doing a box plot on whether or not something is on the waterfront. So that's actually one of our features. We can say x equals, whoops, waterfront and say y is equal to price state our original data frame and here we can see the distribution of prices whether or not they're on the waterfront so it looks like if you are on the waterfront you are more likely to be more expensive which again kind of makes sense